Um, and now we'll proceed to the opening questions and we'll start with Al. Hello, I'm Al Dugan and I'm running the service of Marin County Supervisor. This is a critical election issue for uh, Marin. I'm ready to protect a small town rural character of Marin, assure Marin is fiscally sound, and restore transparency and public engagement that has been sorely lacking. I have a 24-year proven track record as an executive with successful leadership management and most importantly financial and analytical skills. I retired as an underwriter for Lloyds of London and created complex, multi-layered, multi-billion dollar underwriting programs for such companies as Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. I will address the regional housing allocations to protect our small town character. We need to make sure they match up with our general plans. We spend a tremendous amount of time doing general plans and the regional housing element should match up to that. I will address the pension and the planned company debt deficit. My name is Alex Easton Brown. I've lived in the logging industry for 40 years where I built my house and raised my family. I was trained as a sociologist and I've been doing um, investigative research into government malfeasance since the 1970s. I'm running for a supervisor to change the culture at Civic Center to stop the regional agencies, the consultants, and the developers from calling the shots, to stop the waste and the arrogance. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Dominic Grossi. I'm a fourth generation rancher from up in Novato. My family's been here for about 120 years. So continuing to protect West Marin is extremely important to me, for my children, and for your children in the future, to have the beautiful landscapes that we currently have. Over the past 20 years, I've been very involved in our ag community, serving on numerous committees and boards, where I've served as president of our Holstein Association, um, our Dairy Herd Improvement Association, and, and Marin County Farm Bureau as well, where I got extremely involved in our local coastal plan, and have been working actively on that ever since for the past eight years. And that has given me a lot of policy experience, working on things that are necessary to continue to protect the rural landscapes that we have. And so that is something that I want to continue to protect. Um, I currently serve as president of the Sonoma Marin Fair Board, of which I'm a governor appointee as. Uh, I spent many years on the malt board as well. And so protecting our open space and keeping things moving forward. And then of course, working on all the issues that our county has allowed to, to go downhill, I want to do as well. Can you hear me, or do I have to go close to it? I have to go close to it. All right, I'm bending down. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wendy Callens, and um, I'm best known as the founder and program director of the Safe Routes to Schools program. Um, through that program, we have been able to get in over $30 million in safety improvements around schools and reduce the uh, amount of traffic so that now half of the children uh, attend, who attend schools are finding a green way to school. I have a wide breadth of experience from years of community service, and I've been involved for the past 30 years in issues as diverse as transportation, land use, housing, protecting open space, health and safety, environmental protection, and climate change, which is one of my key issues. I've always believed that our government is best when it acts as a partner to its citizens, and I want to be your partner as your supervisor. And I'm here tonight to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Well, she had to bend down. I'm definitely going to have to bend down. Um, <laughs> I might just try to bring this up. OK, there we go. My name is Thomas Castellanos. I'm a first generation American Lithuanian. And I actually didn't speak English for my first language. Um, but what you'll find out in the 10 plus hours of video that's been shot from all of our candidate events is a pretty diverse background. When I was 19, I managed my first million dollar restaurant. I had 55 employees. By the time I was 26, I managed a $150 million a year contract with 1,500 employees. For the last 15 years, I've served the US Coast Guard Reserves. For the last eight years, I've served FEMA as a disaster operations supervisor and training manager. In addition, the last four years as an elected board member of the Nevada Fire District. You'll find out that I have uh, the business acumen, uh, 
the accountability. I'm appointed by the president to represent the federal government in coordinating the federal response to areas from as far away as Guam uh, or upstate New York. And I've been to all of those points and in between in addition to my work as a uh, hazmat environmental specialist. So please learn my background. Uh, vote for me on June 2nd. <laughs> I'm going to try and do this standing up. I think I can talk loud enough. I'm Dennis Ferdoni. I reside in Olima with my wife of 37 years, Judy. I'm a West Marin native. I was raised in Point Reyes Station, attended local schools, and graduated from Cal State University of Chico with an honors degree in economics. The last 34 years, I've run a construction company in West Marin specializing in remodels. Prior to that, I was a high school teacher in Sonoma and Australia. Uh, the Sierra Club and the West Marin Ranchers have endorsed me. I'm the only candidate I've been endorsed by both. Uh, my experience, though, is what makes me the best choice for this job of replacing Steve Kinsey. For over 20 years, I've been a North Marin Water Board Director and serving water issues in Nevada and West Marin. I've been on the 14 years on the Marin County LASCO, Local Agency Formation Commission, where I worked on decisions on zoning, annexation, consolidation, municipal service reviews for all county agencies. I was one of five votes that gave you the right to decide if you were to be consolidated a year or two ago, because I believe strongly in having that right. Thank you. My name is Brian Staley. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm a third generation Californian who was raised in Marin County, and it's really been a pleasure. Uh, my area of expertise in the field of construction is sustainable design. As part of my career experience, I've become very familiar with all state and county regulations as they pertain <clears throat> to habitat, land management, waste and its treatment, and zoning. I'm running for supervisor because we need strong leadership to assist our communities dealing with enormously impactful new state policies, which will bring unprecedented change to our neighborhoods. We need a county supervisor with real experience in policy and planning, who will be a steadfast advocate for our communities and the environment. I have the experience necessary after spending three decades as an advocate to slow development in Marin and to improve the health of our communities. I would appreciate your vote. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Mary Tamburo, and I live in Homestead Valley. I have many years of experience uh, serving nonprofit organizations. I have a very diverse background. I'm mostly known as a singer, and I became in interested in local politics when we found ourselves uh, with the prospect of having a sidewalk built on Evergreen Avenue in 2010. And uh, I dove deep into that uh, issue because it touched uh, a part of me to my core from when I was 16. And uh, I was online for a summer job that was being uh, handed out to, to folks of low income. And I heard someone behind me say, just say your income is really low and you'll get the job. But we, um, we filled out the form uh, truthfully and uh, I didn't get the job, but the gal who lied on the application got the job. So that's why <laughs> I, I was so deep into that issue. But we'll talk more about that later. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, everyone. Now we'll proceed to uh, questions and uh, we'll start. Uh, again, at this end with, with Al. And I would like to uh, start with a question we each do. Um, if you were elected, what would you seek to change on the Board of Supervisors? Is this Al Dugan? Yes, Al Okay, could you repeat the question? Yes, I will. If you are elected, what would you seek to change on the Board of Supervisors? Well, there's a couple of key issues I would seek to change. The most critical one we've got to change is we need to create transparency and engagement down at the Board of Supervisors. I've gone to many Board of Supervisors meetings to talk and make comments on important issues that have come up. You go there, the staff and the, the uh, Marin County Supervisors have already decided what they're going to do. You make a comment, they read their pre-prepared statements, 
and the decision is made. So it's a waste of time to go down there right now. I'm going to make sure we have meetings ahead of time on critical issues to get public engagement in to the staff so that staff has time to integrate what the public has to say before I look at it as a, as a Marin County supervisor. Thank you. Yes. I object to the cronyism at Civic Center. Uh, that all too often the staff really runs the show. Uh, the department heads don't have enough uh, supervision and I feel that uh, a lot more can be done. The problem is there's too much money in Marin. Too much tax money works its way to Civic Center and uh, so everybody's careless with it. Yes, there's a lot of things that need changing. Uh, transparency is clearly one of them. Something that the Board of Supervisors needs to do is start opening up the consent agenda so people can see exactly what's on it. It's something that gets voted through and millions of dollars get spent that way every year. Another thing that I think is problematic is um, when we look at staff, the department heads all report directly to the Board of Supervisors. Most other county and other municipalities, your, your heads of department report to, for example, here it should be Matthew Heimel, our county administrator, to have that go between so they can fix issues before it even gets to the supervisor. So the supervisors are dealing with a lot of stuff that they shouldn't even have to be talking about right now. So that's another change I would make. And then one other thing I think is important. We've talked about pensions. A lot of us might, might come up again later and the need to make sure that we're actively involved in having some sort of pension reform. It's going to be difficult to make major pension reform as long as we don't let things get worse because a lot of changes have already occurred. But what we can work is on, on is the health care side of things. We wouldn't have to cut any health care, but we should be running our county employees through the Affordable Care Act, and that would save us millions. Thank you. Right, before we get, don't start timing me until I figure out how to start. <laughs> start when you utter your first word. Okay. <laughs> Bring it up. Okay. We have contact. Thank you. All right. Well, when I started this campaign, the first thing I did was start holding roundtable discussions. Uh, I had one right here in Homestead, and what I find is that when you can get people around a table, not just talking to the elected official, but also talking to each other, it's amazing what kind of ideas and problem solving can take place. So I, I agree, there is not a lot of hearing that goes on in public hearings. And that's not just about what the people who are elected, whether or not they're hearing um, what the people are saying, but also whether people are listening to each other. And I think it's really important, especially when people have opposing views, that we start listening to each other. Because I think we find we have more in common than we have uh, differences. So my idea is to keep having these roundtable discussions throughout the district, throughout my tenure as supervisor, and allow you to be engaged and involved right from the beginning in figuring out how we're going to solve the various different issues that are facing us. <coughs> So I'm going to apologize in advance. I should have said this early on, but I'm going to have to depart at 6.30 because I made a commitment to raise money for veterans housing in Marin County. So at that time, I'll just depart. But um, to the question, if you look at my website, thomasformarin.com, I filed three complaints against former board members for some of their activities on the board. And what I would say about the, uh, board is, uh, the county, uh, they don't have a reserve policy of $140 million in reserve. They're not telling you how much they're going to spend, what their limits are, and what the intended purpose is. Additionally, as Dominic has already mentioned, the, the how employees are managed, either from the supervisors and then through the, through the rest of the department heads, is broken. Commission heads are telling you that they can't get the simplest reports from staff. The building departments and the permit departments don't communicate. So I want to create an accessible and accountable government for you. You can't even pay things online right now. Even for running for office, I had to take a day off of work just to file my paperwork because all they take are checks and cash. So, I mean, you know, these kinds of things are commonplace in most modern businesses, and it's not in the county, and I would change that. Anyone that followed my career as a politician for the last 21 years knows I'm a big proponent of open and transparent government. My cell phone or home phone's always been on my card. 
I take phones, I actually answer my phone when people call me, which I think is a good thing. I'll continue to do that as supervisor. Uh, three things that I'd like to change, though. First of all, I should say I'm going to also have uh, meetings in all parts of the district once a month. You're going to see me down here once a month to come down and meet you here so you don't have to come to the Civic Center and see me. The other thing that I'd like to change is uh, offer evening meetings to the Board of Supervisors so more people can attend. Secondly, I want to increase the technology there where you can actually call in during a board meeting and ask the question. The other things I want to change is I want department heads to be at the counter meeting the public four hours a month. Minor thing to ask, but an important thing to do. The other things I want to do is when staff comes to the Board of Supervisors, I don't want them to bring one choice. I want them to bring three choices of how we deal with the issue they're bringing forth. And that will help us as the Board of Supervisors become more open in itself. Thank you. Well, the question was specifically what types of things were we going to focus on as supervisor? And one of the concerns that I've had from day one for my 30 years of involvement in the community is the fact that the, the county seems to consistently feel that herbicides and pesticides are an appropriate use in our communities. I think that's something that we really need to look at, given the fact that um, uh, the state of California, on, under Proposition 65, has deemed herbicides, uh, specifically glyphosate, as a, as a known carcinogen. We just can't have uh, uh, carcinogenic materials in our community. The other thing I'd like to mention is the fact that there's a huge new set of regulations that are coming down that are going to be affecting not only my community, but yours as well. These are water quality regulations, and they're going to fall almost entirely on the local homeowners to be able to pay for the upgrades that are necessary in order to meet these new criteria, costing uh, homeowners as much as $70,000. The, the county has an obligation, I feel, to be able to set up an account to offer either zero interest loans or very low interest loans for the people who are going to be impacted by these regulations. Thank you. All right, thank you. First, I would like to increase communication, not only from the county to uh, the citizens, but throughout departments, because I've noticed uh, throughout my experience when I thrust myself into local politics in 2010, I did a lot of research and I found out that the departments are not talking to each other. And since I do have a communications background, I think this is something that I excel in. And I would really, one of the great things about this particular process is that we've been able to meet with, with all these community leaders and I look forward to uh, the opportunity to work with each and every one of them as we move forward should I be elected supervisor. Because it's really important that we do continue our involvement and to, to get every citizen's input on matters that they are concerned with. We each have a unique perspective and an opportunity to share our life experiences and enhance the entire uh, experience for all of us in our communities and I also have experience with the community built process and we'll talk more about that later thank you thank you thank you everyone um, the next question is something that uh, that uh, have, what was touched on in the in these answers and I'll read this question from uh, an audience member a countywide issue also a homestead issue the county will not allow homesteads open space land custodian to use roundup to kill poison oak on our trails, which has been successfully practiced, or successful practice, successfully for decades. Poison oak on trails is a public health hazard. What is your position on the use of Roundup in public, on public lands? And for this question, we'll start with Alex. Roundup is a known carcinogen. Uh, I have poison oak on seven acres that I uh, live on, and I take care of it myself mechanically every year. Not every every, every year, actually. You can cut it and let it go for a couple of years and then hit it again. Um, I've used Roundup in the past, and uh, I can see the attraction toward using it, uh, and the homeowner's attraction toward using it, but uh, it is a carcinogen, and uh, you, a lot of homeowners are pretty irresponsible in their use of it. So as a rancher that's in the process of going organic right now, I think the county should kind of focus on that as well and try to do everything they can to limit the amount of Roundup being used. 
But that being said, it's one of those options I think you need to leave on the table. If a community gets together and they want to use it to protect their own trails uh, from something like, like poison oak, then they should have that right, especially within that community. And it's interesting because Roundup is not illegal that the county is telling you you guys can't use it here. So I think that option should be made available, but we should be trying to limit the use of it. And it should all be, also be noted there are there are other options at this point as for spraying. You know, the spraying, first of all, should be done by hand. You shouldn't have any massive sprayers, big booms going through. I would make sure that you limit the amount or how you spray. And But there are other options that are now non-carcinogenic. So I've been learning about this as we go through the process of becoming organic on our place, that you can spray other, there are other things out there that will kill stuff um, like poison oak. And you guys should be able to use whatever option fits you. But one good point Alex did make was the fact that homeowners throughout West or, or Marin County do use way too much. Well, this is this is an issue that has been uh, coming up for me a lot because a lot of my supporters, as an environmentalist, are asking me to support the total ban on the use of glyphosate. And um, I would like I would like to see it uh, completely eliminated because I don't like the uh, I look this is a carcinogen and we shouldn't be using carcinogen in our open spaces, but I think this points to one of the reasons why we have to do this in a methodical way. We have to look at the uh, alternatives and there are alternatives available, and we have to you know the county is phasing out the use of these carcinogens. I think that's a good thing. But we have to remember that before we completely eliminate them, there are endangered species that we have to protect. We have to protect ourselves from fire danger. So we have to recognize that there are competing environmental interests that, um, that we're looking at here, and we have to take a balanced approach as we phase out these carcinogens. Thank you. Thank you. So I have the same position Dominic does. I don't think you should remove anything from the table that could potentially help you. You know, we're, we're adults. We can figure out what we're supposed to do and you, you pass ordinances and regulations that says how much you should or shouldn't use. I'm the only person up here who is actually a, an expert in hazmat environmental response. I would bet there's probably chlorine over there in that pool house. That's a suffocant. Uh, regular oil, that's also a carcinogen. So are we gonna also ban oil? Because I'm sure I swam in it when I swam 13 miles in the bay last a couple weeks ago. So it just, I think there's a smart way of doing it. People need to be able to have the tools at their disposal for what they need to in a responsible way. They can be monitored. We can we can measure how much we actually spray, but we can do it in the right way. And there are alternatives. So we should be working towards a goal that reduces all of our exposure to chemicals. And there are hundreds of people, hundreds of chemicals that we use on a daily basis on the ban list, and glyphosate isn't one of them yet. My position from day one has been we need to work to eliminate all use of pesticides in the county, both private and public, but we're not quite there yet. There's some needs that we have to address, and we have to figure out ways to address those, one being fire, the big risks. All the fire people are saying we need these tools, and uh, so that's important. Endangered species are another issue why we need to use some of these. But Omni-approved things that are being used to treat weeds and other things that are approved for organic farmers um, are coming more and more are coming on the market and becoming more and more available. And that's why I believe eventually the county and I hope most of the private people will move to some other form of using omni-approved things which are non-toxic and won't hurt you. Um, getting back to the fire though, I have a brochure over here. If you didn't get one in the mail, take it home with you because there's a there's a message in there about alertmarin.org, and you need to all know about that message because the risk of fire here in Homestead is tremendous, and I want to make sure you're all safe and get out of your homes when you need to. The important thing to note about glyphosate specifically as it relates to the use on uh, non-native, invasive, and specifically, as was mentioned, uh, poison oak, is the fact that the international research uh, um, body uh, the IARC for research on cancer, has found um, through a whole series of studies that not only is the Monsanto claim that it's a non-persistent chemical, um, they actually started finding it in young children who would normally not be exposed to it, they're finding it in people of all ages, and it's something that, um, that is seriously being considered uh, for the purpose of 
um, not only labeling under Proposition 65 as is required, but um, for uh, the state uh, is, is very much considering trying to inform uh, homeowners on the excessive use. Now, as uh, Dominic had mentioned, there are other opportunities, there are other chemicals that can be used that are certainly not as harmful and not as dangerous, and there are other means, things like goats and other um, other approaches that are just as effective. Goats actually love to eat poison. <laughs> Yes, I'm anti-glyphosate and pro-goat. <laughs> we have goats in Homestead Valley, and, we, and we, we could probably use a few more. But for all the reasons uh, stated by my co-candidates for banning it, I, I echo those sentiments, and um, I really don't need to add anything else. Thanks. I, I believe this should be banned. There's a preponderance of evidence that shows that Roundup is definitely toxic. And right now, there are other products out there that are bio-friendly that will do the same job right now. And uh, I worked with the Corps of Engineers up at Lake Sonoma when they replaced Roundup. They got rid of all the Roundup that they had up there. So I would highly recommend you go with something that is bio-friendly, that will still do the job, and will not put you at risk, and will not put the land and the accumulation of that particular chemical in the soil, which has a future effect. Thank you. Thank you. The next question uh, uh, is with regard to LAFCO, where do you stand on consolidation of the sewerage districts in Southern Marin? And for this question, we'll start with Dominic. So that's a good question. I, I really think it comes down to the individual communities to look at what they want to do if they want to consolidate to make sure it fits their needs as well. Um, consolidation in general can be a good thing. It can save overall, it can save money, but you need to make sure that the people that are going to be affected by that consolidation are in favor of it. So what I would be doing is working with those communities to find out what exactly it is that they want. Uh, you know, I would work to put a ballot on the measure if they needed to do that to make sure that is something that they stand behind. I'm going to try what other, everybody else is doing and <laughs> forget the mic and stand up. Um, you know, I, this is an interesting question and one that we have not gotten yet, so that's nice to get something new. And, and I think a lot of others, because I've been working in all the school districts, and like there's 13 different school districts in Marin County, and sometimes you have to think about, you know, how much overlap there is going on and how expensive it can be and yet at the same time I also know there's a there's unique culture in every single one of those school districts. Now I'm not that familiar with the sewer situation but I do know that Central Marin Police used they used to be there used to be a Corte Madera and Larkspur Police then there was the Twin Cities Police and now it's Larkspur, um, <coughs> Corte Madera and San Anselmo Police and you know what the best traffic uh, cops are in the Central Marin Police because they have the economy of scale to be able to put enough people out there to really serve. I'm into, I'm into creating things systemically and our waste treatment system is a system and I think we really need to look at whether consolidating these sewers is actually a better way to go in, in order to uh, treat our sewage. Thank you. Thank you. I use the microphone because the table is going to be terribly short. I'm six foot four, so <laughs> I'm probably knock it over. Um, so there are 52 special districts in the county. Um, I worked for one of them for four years as a director, um, and there are some values in consolidation, right? So you're able to share, and, and it's funny because there are actually three offices in the Nevada Fire District. Mayor works out of there. Um, there's a couple of other offices that that also rent space, and they hire a director, and then they have staff. And then you, know, then you have additional meetings. And for me, it is about effectively being able to provide the services that you're supposed to provide. And quite honestly, I found deficiencies in the services that were being provided when I came onto the board. And if that's the case, somebody needs to change that. And I know that the Board of Supervisors will govern over 20 of those. So there's, a, there's possibly an opportunity to look at consolidation, but it is about what the community wants and then what the community needs. And can we more effectively do it in another way? And I'm willing to explore that. Okay. Um, 
and my wife's not in the audience, so this, she didn't ask this question because, as you know, I said I was on LAFCO for 14 years and went through many public hearings about this subject of consolidation. Why, on the outset, it seems to make sense. Uh, at the end, it didn't make sense because you voted not to be consolidated. And I believe that's because you, like me, believe in local and local control. And you like to have a sanitary district that meets here on every other Tuesday. And you can come and complain to them and have someone that you see on the street that represents you. And I think that's unique to Marin. I might add that the special district president, association president, I understand why we have special districts. It's because no one wanted to do the services in California when California grew so quickly. The only way you could get sewer water in some of the garbies and garbies in community service districts was because you could form a special district and do it. Otherwise, when California was growing quickly, no one was there to serve these people and serve you. So they formed a special district, and that's why there's 3,000 of them in California and 31, 31 special districts in Marin that are independent special districts. Thank you. Homestead Valley is unique on a, for a, many reasons, but uh, specifically on this subject, one of the things that makes Homestead Valley so unique is that you don't have just one sewage system. You have properties that are up on the hill that are on septic, as well as properties that are part of a major sewer system. So there's no one fix. There's no one thing that's going to make anything better. Um, when you consolidate, as Dennis had indicated, um, oftentimes what it ends up doing is pulling the local control out of the community, which is a real problem. And I would call your attention to a recent article in the IJ that came out today um, about the, the concentration of the MTC and ABAG. Uh, there's a battle going on right now, and it seems that um, whenever you do concentrate these kinds of entities and these kinds of organizations, you really do lose local control and local power. One of the last things I'll say is that um, the Redwood Sanitary uh, district, district, which uh, you know is responsible for San Rafael, San Anselmo, um, um, uh, Fairfax, um, is is having major financial problems. They are millions and millions of dollars in debt, and that's something that concentration creates. Okay. Ross. Well, one of the things um, that uh, concerns me about consolidation again is local control. I was very proud to be part of the uh, communication outreach that helped us prevent uh, consolidation in Homestead Valley through one of my blogs. And um, what I see as the benefit of co consolidation, the, the concept of consolidation is an increase in communication. But we sacrifice the local control. So if we could just increase the communication between all the districts, we can share best practices, and uh, that would end up being a beneficial uh, thing. Instead of, instead of consolidation, we can keep local control and increase efficiency and save money by increasing communication. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been an executive for the last 24 years, and these are the kinds of things I dealt with every day. I don't know the details of this, but one of the things I would do is look at all the positive, all the negatives on both sides, and try to understand what makes sense. I will usually default to local control because I think with local control, you end up getting the closest results of meeting the needs of the people on a consistent basis. So, but I would look at it very carefully. I would weigh it. I think we always have to look at anything that we can look at that can maybe make sense and save us money down the road. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in favor of consolidation uh, when it is feasible. For our next question, um, this is a countywide issue as well as a homestead issue. Trails on the homestead's open space lands adjacent to the GGNRA are assigned to prohibit bicycles. Mountain bicycles sometimes illegally use these trails even at night. What would you do uh, to, to help keep this law uh, being observed? And Wendy is first, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, the mountain bikers 
uh, the, the scofflaws, as I like to call them the jerks, <laughs> who, <laughs> they really make it, uh, they make a bad name for all mountain bikers because there are plenty of people who like to ride mountain bikes and obey the rules and use the trails where they're supposed to be <clears throat> and they're polite on the trails and these people really make a bad name for the rest of the mountain bikers. So we really do need to beef up enforcement. The Open Space District now is going to have a speed radar that they're going to be using on the Open Space District. And I kind of buck my biking friends as I'm one of the people who really thinks we actually should license bicycles because that gives us an opportunity to know who's breaking the rules and who's not. The issue is that if we're going to license bicycling, we have to do it at a state level. So that's something that I actually will work on and see if I can convince my biking friends to join me on that one. Thank you. So I'm not a proponent of anybody breaking the law, so they should be held accountable. But I do believe that we need to create more opportunities for more trails, whether that is building more parks so they can go to very specific locations and be able to exercise. Um, but I do believe in getting outside. I believe we need an active and engaged populace uh, we're more engaged when we're outside and we're exercising and we're doing those things and they want to do that just like hikers do just like people who walk their dogs and so on so a way of being able to mitigate why there's so much illegal riding is to give them more places to ride um, and i've got a number of friends i ride um, and we talk a lot about okay well where, where can we go well we got to drive 25 minutes to the nearest place that's very difficult if you just want to ride directly out. And I live at the back of a, a mountain that I'd love to ride up, but I won't because it's illegal. So it, it's just that balance of we've got to create a little a more opportunity for a populace that only gets 18% of our open space. My responsibility as a supervisor for open space is the same as the GGNRAs and the Point Reyes National Seashores. It's to protect the resource. That's, that's our number one goal. That's our number one responsibility. Having said that, having open space and trails and all sorts of places that people can use is really important. It's part of our system here, and we have to have that available so people can enjoy it. Any new trails, though, need to be considered on an individual basis about who uses them, what access they have. And I, I'm a big proponent that everyone gets equal access, but I'm also a big proponent on the trails have to be enforced, whether it be by horse, by foot, by dogs, or by bikers. If they're doing damage to the trail, and they're damaging the resource, we need to have enforcement to take those people and have the fines big enough so they won't do it again and understand that protecting the resource is our primary goal, that we have that responsibility. Thank you. I think it's important that we put this subject into context. We're talking about uh, the, the trails that are, the bikers are not allowed on are single track trails. Bikers um, and equestrians and hikers are allowed on every road, dirt road that a vehicle can be on already. So they have access to an enormous range of, of trails. Um, there's also a pretty activist group of individuals who create illegal trails. And these, uh, these individuals um, go up into the hills and unfortunately in many cases have gone through the center of some of our most sensitive habitat. Um, for those of us like, like me who uh, uh, care very deeply about uh, some of the more sensitive aspects of our community, I live in San Geronimo Valley where we have a lot of them, uh, fern, fern grottos, uh, sensitive rare species, um, in many cases uh, we see uh, illegal trails created um, outside of the control of the county straight through these incredibly sensitive habitats. And we need to make sure not only that individuals are not endangering hikers um, and equestrians, but that these uh, trails are put to sleep. Well, see, the question is what would we do to stop them from being scufflaws on our homestead trails, okay? So, well, well, I think we could use some technology for that. Maybe a GPS locator inside a bicycle that deactivates the bike when it's in an <laughs> appropriate area. I don't know. I'm just thinking outside the box here. But uh, at least we could find, find people. But I do, I'm also, I agree with Wendy. I think bikes should be definitely licensed so that we could report people who are breaking the law, just like drivers uh, are reported when they're breaking the law. I think it's a good idea. And that would also give us a funding source for more enforcement. Thank you. Thank you.
There are two key issues here. Number one, we've got to protect the environment. We've got to make sure that nothing is going out on the trails that is impacting the environment. Number two is safety. We've got to make sure that people can go out on the trails and be safe. There isn't enough enforcement on the trails. That's the major problem out there. The, there isn't, bicyclists are, are, there's only, I understand, like two rangers out there patrolling all the areas. They have guns, uh, speed guns, but that isn't enough. And there, what I understand is there's really not tickets given, there's just warnings given. So I think we have to address this and we have to get enough enforcement out there to make sure that people are safe and that the, it, the environment is not being damaged. I proposed a, a licensing bicycles last summer and I expected a firestorm of opposition. So it's really nice tonight to hear a couple people in agreement. Uh, that opposition never, never even uh, developed even among the bicycle people that I talked to. So that was curious because uh, most people in politics are pretty much afraid of the bicycles because they, they're a pretty uh, intense lobby. Uh, as far as trails go, I'm a foot person myself. I think uh, bikes should be segregated and kept off the trails. They're really a, a, an alien technology, just, what, just like the automobile was when it was first uh, introduced, uh, scaring horses and uh, scaring pedestrians. Uh, it has the same effect. And I've been on a trail and have somebody come up behind me quickly and quietly and say, uh, on your left, and I impulsively move to my left. So, I, you know, I've, I've been threatened several times that way. <laughs> so. So it's been said already by a few people that the first thing we have to do is protect the environment because that's the resources. And I completely agree with that. At the same time, we do have to find other trails, I think, for people who are paying taxes and want to ride bikes. So to keep everyone safe, I think that additional trails where they're environmentally appropriate would work to help probably keep bikers off the trails up here where they're not supposed to be. So the road and trails management plan has created that program where they can bring new trails into you know into existence. Some will just be foot trails, but some would also be bike trails. And by doing that, by creating the road and trails management plan, it makes it very clear there's a very extensive environmental review that would have to occur in order to get those trails. So at least we're looking at the right things um, to try to keep everybody safe. We we would like everyone to get along. To me, there's a small group of people that that don't, and they had some issues. But I think most people have tried to get along. With the specific question about people being illegal up here, they shouldn't be up here, plain and simple. It's illegal until we can get those or other trails for them. Thank you. Um, uh, next question, starting with uh, Tomas. Um, what would you propose doing to protect our creeks from raw sewage? Uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, as somebody who's actually had to surf in raw sewage, it was, uh, I was in San Luis Obispo and they had a million gallons dump out into Avila Bay on one of the biggest days that we've had in surfing. It was an experience like nothing else. Um, but we have an a aging infrastructure system. I know that the two sewer districts have been recently downgraded on their bonds because they have to make $50 million investments. Um, and I've very openly said that we have $600 million in our investment pool and it's earning one-tenth of one percent. We probably need to look at some sort of public financing or public banking to look at how we're going to be able to make infrastructure investments accessible for these special districts. They have the cash to be able to pay, um, but we need to be able to give them leverage. And I can tell you that I postponed the, the building of a firehouse so we could try and get another point off of our, of our loan and accumulate a little bit more cash, and we were successful. But it, it's gonna take some work, and it is about infrastructure and improvements on those systems. The county, through the environmental health, is responsible for any sewage problems along with the state agencies. The states trigger, get triggered because of water quality issues. Um, so I think it's twofold. Sanitary districts need to keep up their infrastructure. That's the key. And I think we found that out when locally we had some large spills. The infrastructure wasn't being maintained. They started doing that and they corrected that. And the state water board demanded that as their fines that they do improvements. So that's a good thing. On the flip side, we have a lot of creeks and waterways that are um, next to 
individual sewage systems, in particular in San Geronimo and up in the top of here. Some of those systems could impact waterways here. And it's the county's job to watch after those systems and make sure they function correctly. It's the homeowner's responsibility, too, to make sure they're pumped, to make sure they're functioning correctly. But mostly, to replace the septic system is really, really expensive, even for us that are, are, are well off and we can afford maybe to do it sometimes, sometimes we can't. The county needs to be cooperative. In some cases, we need to have loans or uh, low interest money available so people can make it, so they can do the right thing and replace their system. The county of Marin uh, it just completed what is called the Local Area Management Plan, which is a set of guidelines for uh, siting, controlling, and regulating uh, septic systems and sewage systems, in, uh, specifically in the rural and uh, semi-rural communities like yours. Um, what essentially that does is it sets a set of regulations, and the county has not historically had an opportunity and, uh, and or the funding necessary in order to actually do the testing. Um, in most cases, what is uh, the, the waterways, specifically that we're referring to, the creeks, um, in, in Marin County, most of them have been designated as impaired. They've been designated as impaired due to sediments, due to nitrogen, and due to pathogens. Um, what has not been done, and uh, I'm the chair of the San Geronimo Valley Planning Group, and we're actually setting aside monies and working with um, Marin Municipal Water District specifically to test our waterways to differentiate animal E. coli from human E. coli. And this will answer an enormous question about just what is impacting our water system. Okay, I think we need to do as a county a better job of communicating with uh, the local water groups. There are so many. We've got the uh, Marine, well, of course, we've got MMWD, which is, which is our municipal water district. But we have a lot of really great people working in the watershed um, environment as far as uh, the, the Watershed Alliance of Marin. We've got various different uh, creek steward programs, Mill Valley Stream Keepers. And what I would propose is to get all these people together and um, again, share best practices as well as uh, the low interest loans that were mentioned for homeowners to upgrade our uh, lateral lines, which we already have that program through the Homestead Valley Sanitary District. and. Uh, it just comes down to communication, information, sharing, cooperation. It's all it's it's all a good thing. Thanks. Thank you. Well, this is an issue for the uh, sewage districts to bring their infrastructure up to speed and to keep it moving forward. We we need to have that as a as a critical issue, and we got to figure out a way to make sure that we can fund that moving forward. That's critical. And it's also up to Marin County to enforce septic tanks and to make sure we have good monitoring of those programs. And I, I firmly believe if, if uh, we should be able to look at low interest loans for people that cannot maintain their septic tanks and see if we can come up with a way to help out people in that way. This, uh, the low interest uh, grants are a good idea. Uh, out in the valley where I live, uh, there's perhaps a thousand septic systems that are failing or failed. Uh, the county looks the other way. It's really funny. Uh, there's several contractors that specialize in, I call it fly-by-night uh, septic systems. They'll come in uh, sometimes in the middle of the night and, and uh, replace the system without the permit. And the county just looks the other way. This has to change. So on those occasions, the county, I don't know if they're looking the other way, it's they're just not going out and looking for the problem. And I think they're doing that because they recognize there's thousands of septic systems that might be impaired and that could become overwhelming on the county, county. And they would absolutely shut down people. They'd have to literally kick them out of their homes so they can't use their septic systems. There's a bill that went through the state that's going to require septic systems get updated. And as Brian alluded to it in his opening statement, it could cost sixty, seventy thousand dollars to get those updated. Our county is going to have to step in and help us out. I would go as far as saying no interest loans because this is something that's extremely important to our creeks, our stream size, and to the people who live there. We all want our septic systems to work. So that's where it is on the septic systems. 
Uh, we've seen Central Marin Sanitation has had some spills, so there's infrastructure issues there as well, and we need to work with those agencies to make sure that they're not causing pollution problems. In fact, the pollution problems they are are a much larger scale than what our septic systems are. So I think helping the people out where we can, and maybe sometimes you have to look the other way to help them get things fixed up. Well, when you have to look at it, there's, there's, we have the sewer systems, and of course we've seen that there, you know, the spills that have happened over the last few years and the aging infrastructure that needs to be brought up to speed. There's the ailing septic systems, and we have them in the San Juan Valley. But I think we need to go a step further because uh, we need to look at ways in which we actually reuse our systems and find new systems besides septic systems because in many places, for instance, Marshall just put in a community-based sewer system that brings all of their, that gets rid of the septic systems altogether and creates something that's much more environmentally sound. There are also, we are in the 21st century and there are waste treatment systems that actually treat the waste before it ever goes out into the ground, getting to the point of zero waste. And some other counties, like Sonoma County, has actually approved some of these kind of systems. Marin County needs to look at these systems as well. They're far less expensive than septic systems, and in many cases, far more effective. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next question, and we'll start with, uh, next question, we'll start with Dennis. Thank you. Um, public employee pensions are in the news. How would you address the challenge going forward in making the system sustainable and fair to both the employees and the taxpayers? Thank you. I just want to say no one will get chased away from their home if the septic system is failing. They require you to just pump your tank on a regular basis. Um, but on pensions, we've made a lot of changes on pensions, and new employees in particular have a lot less in pensions and, in, and health care than original employees had. So that's all good changes, and some of that came down from the mandates from the state. We still have a responsibility, though, to all the previous employees and all the contracts that we agreed with to provide the funds to make sure that people can retire. And so as part of that, we have to do good money management. I like the idea of buying down pensions when you have reserve, and I like that very much. We did that at North Marin Water District, bought down $2 million of pension loan that we took out and it will save the customer $850,000 between now and 2025. So there's a good move. The other thing that uh, I wanted to point out is at the county, all employees don't earn the big dollars that you see reported in the paper. <clears throat> I have a cousin who retired from the fire department 35 years. He makes 58000 a year in retirement. That's not a lot in the uh, I'd like to just quickly comment uh, about something Wendy had just said, which is uh, the Marshall uh, uh, septic system is just a giant septic system. So it's not special, it's not unique, it's just one location. And the reason they did, they did it at all was because they were finding human effluent directly into Mollus Bay, where they grow oysters. So they pretty much had to. Um, with regard to the, uh, the pension issue, this is a whipping boy for conservatives. Um, um, uh, there had been a history of the supervisors not, um, not paying into the, the plan the way they should. They have recently paid down almost half of it, so the efforts have been in the right direction. And so I don't think it's as severe a dynamic as it is described to be. Um, I'd also like to say that I think the direction that um, some organizations are pushing for is uh, uh, concerning. I think it's inappropriate for people who are making forty or fifty thousand dollars as pension and are in retirement to be called in to negotiate even further down uh, their pensions. I think that um, the the county uses pensions as a tool to attract qualified individuals, and I think it's just not appropriate for uh, uh, us to be in a situation where we're. Um, telling pensioners that they can't have the money. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Mary? Well, personally, I, I don't understand why Marin County doesn't have a comptroller. And I would like to look into uh, that possibility because, uh, you know, we do have some staff, but I, I don't think we have uh, the level of financial staff that we do need. Uh, as far as pensions go, if people work hard and they get a pension, that's great. Uh, the county's made great strides in trying to become more fiscally responsible in that regard, and so I applaud them on their efforts. If you are curious about the budget and pensions, I suggest you go to open.gov. 
on the Marin County website and check out some of that information. And uh, this is not something that's just isolated in Marin County. This is a statewide, actually a countrywide problem because a lot of people are retiring all at once. And so uh, we're just going to have to work harder at it and make sure that we're financially stable. Thanks. Well, we went from, in the year 2000, from a surplus of $25 million to March 2016 with an unfunded liability of $638 million. So there is a problem, I can assure you of that. Now, part of that problem is the 7.25% return that they're expecting to get on their investments. If we have another recession, every time we have a recession and we drop down to one or two percent, we have, we have more unfunded liability. And last year, with only a slight market correction, they only got a 5% return, not a 7.25% return. So I'm the only candidate endorsed by Citizens for Sustainable Pension Plans, and they looked at my past financial work, and I will make sure we pay the people we owe pensions to. That's a given, but we gotta fix this system moving forward and we'll start losing services in Marin County. California teachers typically will make 35000 at the most a year for the pension. I propose capping the, the pension will pay in Marin to $80,000. Beyond that, the person can invest his money in the 401k, but the county would not be involved. Also, we need to stop paying the health care when people can be on Medicare. Uh, Medicare works really well, and there's no sense in the county uh, trying to hold uh, do what Medicare does better. Uh, also, the retirement factor. Um, teachers have a retirement factor, which is a multiplier used in figuring their pension of 2%. Marin County uses a 3% retirement factor, and I think it should be reduced to 2.2%. So the, the pensions that are out there, they are vested rights, so we can't go in and take those. That would be illegal. So what we need to do is figure out how to pay down the pension deficit, and that means finding money. So that's why I look on the healthcare side of things. And without taking any healthcare away from our employees or our retirees, by running them through the Affordable Health Care Act, there is millions and millions of dollars that could be saved there to help pay down those benefits um, on the pension side of things. With regards to additional reform, there have been several changes over the past few years. January 1st, 2013, PEPRA was introduced. And it did, it raised the retirement age for your normal employees up to 62 instead of 55. It raised the retirement for your um, protective services from 50 up to 57. So when you have those types of workers now working that additional seven years and getting a lower amount at 2% um, or 2.7% for the protective services instead of 3%, that's gonna make a huge difference down the road. We're not gonna see those savings for a long time but eventually we will get there if we can start putting away some money now. The first thing we have to realize is that uh, our, our county employees are not on Social Security. So the pensions is all they have. Uh, also, the reason we have a, a, a deficit now is, not because, is because, mainly because of the crash of 2008, but also because of some bad decisions that were made when we were in the boom times. We shouldn't be making decisions about our, our retirement plans in the boom times any more than we should be making our decisions when we're in bad economic times. The, uh, I think the one thing that we really do need to look at is what's called double dipping, which is when someone retires, uh, usually in a management position, and then gets hired by another government agency in a management position, and they continue to collect their pension from their old job while they're being paid um, six digits for their new job. So I think that that's one, way, one thing that we need to insist, that anyone who's hired by the county needs to forego their pension from their previous job while they are working for the county. Thank you. So since this is my final answer, um, <laughs> I figured I'd stand up and you can see how funny it really looks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I did write a, a very extensive and lengthy article about this. I spent, excuse me, 
Um, I spent two years as the uh, finance chair at the fire district, arguably the largest fire provider and emergency services provider in the county. So I could talk for hours about this specific issue, but I wrote an article and I give you very specific recommendations. My business card and my personal cell phone number are sitting on that table. So you're welcome to read it, thomasformarin.com. What I would say, since this is our very last candidate event, I wanted to thank the seven other people that are running. This is not easy. This has been a marathon this week. This is probably going to extend us about seven hours of candidate um, engagement just this week alone. And we all, I think most of us have a job and you know families to look after and those kinds of things. So I wanna wish them best luck. Um, it's actually been quite a pleasure to be able to hear the different points of view and whomever either it's a run runoff or wins, I think we've got people to lean on. So it's been my pleasure uh, to also speak with all of you. I know I came to your annual meeting um, and so best of luck, hopefully you vote for me when you decide, um, but if not, uh, so be it, at least you're, you're voting. So thank you very much, and I've had a great time. And just remember, veterans represent 9% of the population in Marin County, and they're only served by one single person in Marin County. Uh, I will fight for the veterans. I'm obviously a currently serving member of the military, but um, we need to do a lot more, and the recent articles about the Veterans Administration is absolutely disdainful. So. Thank you again, and thanks to all of you guys. Good luck. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, moving right ahead, um, we have there have been uh, several comments made about the the current Board of Supervisors, and I would like to ask, uh, and Brian will start uh, and answer this first, and that is, what do you feel the current Board of Supervisors is doing right, and what do you think they're doing wrong? Well, that's a, that, is, that is more than a two-minute... <laughs> <laughs> current Board of Supervisors, what do you think they are doing right and what do you think they are doing wrong? Well, um, as, as an environmentalist, um, uh, which is one of my main focuses, um, and uh, community activist to, to make sure that our, our, our ecosystems and our, our community character uh, remains unchanged, I think uh, a number of things have taken place. Um, high density uh, development is being looked at quite a bit. I think uh, there's, a, there's a policy that was just uh, finalized by the county that was sent to the um, Coastal Commission that is now reviewing it. It's called uh, the local, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, the local coastal program. There are so many acronyms out there. It's a little difficult to keep in track. Um, local coastal uh, program uh, allows for an enormous amount of uh, potential development uh, in, the, in the coastal area, specifically on ranches. Uh, uh, 8,000 square feet uh, of construction, housing construction, um, uh, 5,000 square feet of processing, on-site uh, 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 product sales to, to customers. Um, I think these are the kinds of policies that we need to, even though ranchers need the tools to be able to remain viable, I think these kinds of development proposals are a real concern. Okay, I agree with uh, what Brian just stated about the local coastal program. I think it's a, an inv invitation to more development that we don't need. And I think it, uh, it has the potential to turn Marin County into more of just a giant tourist attraction when we have real communities that are being uh, adversely affected by increased tourism. Um, as far as uh, what they're doing right, I think they're actually trying they're starting to listen more to the citizens because we've demanded it ever since um, 2012. I've noticed an increase in communication and, and actual effort uh, by uh, Kate Sears to do uh, newsletters and um, the other two supervisors as well, uh, Judy Arnold and uh, Katie Rice have also increased their communication. Steve Kinsey, I think um, the best thing he's doing for the county is retiring. <laughs> That's how I personally feel. But um, I'm grateful for his service because he hasn't done everything wrong. He's done some good things. Thanks. Well, since my, my motto for my campaign is time for change, uh, I 
can't cover it all in a minute, but what they are doing right, I will say, I've spent some time down at uh, the Civic Center talking to staff, and Matthew Hemmel and Roy Gibbons, the financial guys and the planners, they're very smart, intelligent guys. I think where the county's gone wrong is just the governance and what they're being told to do. So I'm very optimistic I can work with these guys and make good things happen down there. But, you know, we've got to, number one, protect our small town rural character here. That's critical. And, you know, all the supervisors did the PDAs, the priority development areas. They didn't even tell anybody they were doing them. And they didn't tell anybody what they meant when they were doing them. So, you know, just further lack of, of engagement and transparency. So we've got to open it up and get people involved in government. Thank you. The property values in Miranda are so high that the tax revenues are excessive. And my children, they just kind of uh, uh, treat the money almost like funny money. Uh, whenever something needs to be done, they hire a consultant rather than have their own staff do it. And I feel if the staff can't do it, then we don't need the staff at Civic Center. Let's get rid of them and get somebody in there who can. Civic Center is overstaffed. The, uh, there's way too much money going into the departments. A lot of silly programs. There's a, a county uh, human services building out in uh, Point Ray Station, which is always empty. Uh, every time I go by there, there's nobody there. They want to double the size. Why? There's no point in it. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for this one. So I think that one of the things that, that they have done poorly is their transparency, which I mentioned earlier, and their communication, especially with certain parts of the county. I think Steve Kinsey did a good job of communicating with certain parts of his districts, but not so well with others. I think he did a good job out here. I think he did a good job working with the agricultural community and the ranchers. Um, and the other thing I think that they did well is work with us on the local coastal plan. Okay, We've heard people talk about the enormous amount of, of development. So I want to put it in perspective. There's The average ranch is about 600 acres. Okay, That's 24 million square feet. We've got 24 million square feet, and we're basically saying, okay, you can build an additional home or possibly two up to 7,500 square feet, not 8,000, for future kids to get involved on their ranches. That's how, the only reason I'm a dairyman today is I was allowed to build on our, our family's property. We've got about 7,500 square feet total of, of residential building. And we did that and worked very hard with our county to make sure they understand how important it is. If you want ranching to continue, the children need to be involved. And to me, 20 or 7,500 square feet on a 24 million square foot property is not a lot of development. It's going to give people a chance to stay involved. Well, one example I would give uh, is the work that's being done right now about sea level rise. And I think it's a really good example of, of where um, the county really is opening it up so people can be engaged and involved. And it's a collaborative effort. Too, too often, you know, what done wrong is you'll have uh, uh, the county come in you know, and pave the road and then the sewer district come in after that and sure. dig up the road in order to put the sewer lines in. So lack of communication is, is something that needs to happen. And in this case, that communication is taking place with sea level rise. There's a collaboration with all the cities and towns that the county is organizing. They have mapped all the threats that are out there and they're developing a, a toolbox of what can be done to protect our homes and our facilities and our roads from sea level rise and address those things. And I think they're doing a very good job of doing that. And I think that you're finding that there's a new sentiment and a new attitude at the Civic Center of really getting people engaged and involved at the very, very beginning of a process. And I think that's a really good thing that I want to continue because that's the way I operate. Thank you. Thanks. So I have worked and recently met with all the Board of Supervisors, and I find them to be well-meaning people, really good people for mo most part. The problem is, once you get elected, you get isolated from the constituents, and you surround yourself with people who only tell you what they want you to hear and what they want you to agree to. So that's why I think we're to blame, too, because we as the constituents need to make sure we interact with our elected officials all the time. And that's why I want to open up my process where you're going to have an opportunity to talk to me at least once a month 
and I hope more often than that. But I do believe that their hearts are in the right place and they're trying to do the right thing. For me personally, I'm running again for supervisor I did in 2004 because I thought we needed a stronger environmentalist on the Board of Supervisors. And the Sierra Club agreed with me in 2004 and they agreed with me again this year that I'm the strongest environmental candidate that we have and they want to elect me to represent you on the Board of Supervisors so that I can bring forth the types of things to protect the environment you want me to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for our next question, um, in Martin County, one of our uh, very important issues is that of homelessness. Um, will this be a priority for you uh, in terms of helping to, to uh, stop, if you will, or decrease the number of people who are homeless? And if so, how would you propose doing this? Starting with Mary. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I understand homelessness because I was once homeless. I uh, escaped an abusive situation and found myself homeless for a very short amount of time, but it's a very scary thing. So I think one of the things that we need in a community leader is the ability to empathize with people on a one-to-one -one level, and I have that experience. So I'm grateful for that experience. And um, in my nonprofit work, I've become aware of a lot of really great programs that we have already in Marin. We've got um, Homeward Bound is doing some great things. What I would like to do is uh, bring all these uh, nonprofits together, again, share best management practices, uh, work together on solutions and um, take it from there. there. Homelessness is not, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. There are many different reasons people become homeless. I have friends who are master degrees and they're living in tents in San Francisco, so we obviously need help in a lot of places. Thanks. Yes, with homelessness, there's an issue where there are people that are just have a moment of being down and out, and of course we gotta figure a way to help them. There are people that don't want to work and want to be homeless. That's a different issue. And we got to be able to separate those out and make, make sure we have a way to deal with both of them in the appropriate way. The bottom line for me is I believe the work should mainly be done by nonprofits. And I believe if the county's involved, they should be providing some money to the nonprofits to be able to handle it and make sure that we don't have people that just have a terrible, terrible moment in time and don't have somebody to help them. I proposed using uh, Marin Commons, which is a county-owned office building, uh, which the sheriff uses half of it, the rest of it's empty, it's been sitting empty all this time, as a homeless service center where we can consolidate the services for the homeless. Uh, also, I believe the Board of Supervisors should pass the law as a law. I think we need some compassion in dealing with the mentally ill and uh, drug abusing uh, folks that uh, are a large part of our homeless population. You know, it's interesting that the city of Salt Lake City uh, uh, got rid of 60% of their homeless by contacting uh, their families and friends and buying them bus tickets yeah. and sending them home. Uh, it's not an inter entirely impossible thing to do. So yes, I do view homelessness as something I would put a priority on because we shouldn't just be trying to help the homeless just for them, even, but also for the whole community. Um, you look at San Rafael and there are a lot of homeless who are down on their left, they're out on the streets, and that makes it very difficult for the entire community to, to prosper and move forward. Um, so what we need to do is be, I think, giving these people a hand up and try to find them work, find them a stable place to live. But you have to do that with, with stipulations. They have to keep their jobs if they want to continue to live in a place. I do think we should try to find some, the county should take the lead and try and find a place where they can leave. I don't know that live. I don't know that Marin Commons is the right place for that, but we need to work with, say, San Rafael, where the largest population is, try to find the right area. Um, we have a lot of good programs already going on, like the Ritter House, which provides a lot of great services for our homeless. It's just a matter of finding them the work, keeping them working, keeping them on their medications if they want to stay on it. And that's the only way you're going to give them a chance to become productive members of society. So we have to make a priority of that to try to help them. 
I really feel that we need to treat homelessness in much the same way we've been treating sea, sea level rise. It needs to be a collaborative countywide effort. We've been leaving this to the city of San Rafael to deal with on their own. And it's a combination of um, having facilities that people can go to, but also having homes that they can live in. You know, one of the reasons people are losing their homes is because of the price of housing. And so it's all tied in together. There is different populations, as, as many of my fellow candidates have pointed out. Not everybody is homeless because they're down on their luck. Some people are homeless because they have substance abuse problems. Some have mental illness problems. They're a different breed. We also have a, a, a lack of enforcement. And that's one of the things that uh, a group of, that I've been talking with, um, really we need to take a look at because there are people who are actually breaking the law and they're not being addressed and it's not being enforced. And so we have to look at both helping people out and also enforcing for the troublemakers who are making it bad for everybody else. Thank you. So there's a, a lot of different types of homeless. There's the ones that we see on the street in San Rafael, but there's also families with children that are in need of care and the same care that we provide for the homeless. I was a proponent of Laura's Law. I would have voted with Supervisor Conley and the Board of Supervisors to pass Laura's Law because I think it's important that we have all the tools necessary to deal with homelessness and other issues. I'm a big proponent that we need to find a central service area for all the services for homeless, for people with low incomes. Um, they're talking about a site in the canal um, and that might be a likely place because they have a lot of medical services there that are already run by the Marin Community Foundation. So those are, those are things that I want to look at. Um, we need to also realize that the REST program is a wonderful program run by the nonprofits, funded by the cities, gives individuals a place to stay, but they close it this time of year. It's like homeless people don't need a place to stay when the weather's a little better. It's, it's kind of, kind of doesn't make sense to me. So we would need to find a year-round program that will serve those people too. So we have a lot of work to do on homeless, and, and it's not just the homeless people that we see on the street. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I want to second what Dennis just said about Laura's Law. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what Laura's Law is, it is a special policy that right now has um, in, been incorporated into a lot of other counties in the Bay Area, but uh, Marin County has not voted to enact it. What it does is it allows for uh, family members and uh, the, the government um, to uh, request that an individual who is uh, clearly has uh, mental, mental issues to get uh, what is referred to as um, intensive counseling, to be uh, uh, convinced that, um, that medicine uh, and, and medicinal uh, tools are the best way to go. And in many cases, when you're talking about chronic homelessness, you are talking about um, uh, individuals with mental issues. Um, as Wendy indicated, um, uh, homelessness is not an all-in-one. Uh, it's not specifically uh, um, mental issues, uh, uh, as she had said, it's um, a variety of substance abuse as well as socioeconomic. And the reason that we see so many homeless people in one location in San Rafael is because of Ritter House, which is where most of the services are located. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now the next question will start with, uh, with Al again. And that is, um, whomever gets elected to the Board of Supervisors will find that there are many other committees, commissions, and region, regional agencies um, that require attendance and uh, uh, participation by one, one member of the Board of Supervisors. And I'm wondering what regional issues are of particular interest to you and that you would, you would choose to serve on if given the chance. Well, certainly I would, I think I'd be very valuable on the housing issues with the Association of Bay Area Government and also the Metropolitan Transit Commission because if they do take over ABAG, then we're going to be dealing with the MTC. And we're going to need extremely strong leadership there because uh, MTC runs very differently than ABAG and we just spent three or four years getting a bag straight. So I have worked very closely with Cynthia Kroll, the chief economist at the Association of Bay Area Governments. In fact, I met her on her first day of work 
when they were trying to explain how I had shown that APAG's numbers were 482% higher than the California Department of Finance demographics unit. So that was an interesting first meeting Cynthia and I had. Thank you. I would choose the MTC so I could help shut it down. <laughs> they just, uh, you know, they take all our bridge tools, everything except the Golden Gate Bridge and highway uh, federal highway funds. And uh, they decided they didn't like Oakland because it wasn't classy enough for them. So they went over to San Francisco and they're building a $350 million high-rise headquarters for themselves with our bridge tools. And I think it's preposterous. Uh, Steve Kinsey is in really tight with uh, Heminger and the people that run uh, MTC. MTC is responsible for the bad bolts, uh, the rusty bolts on the Bay Bridge. They're responsible for the seven-year tie-up of, of the construction of the Bay Bridge. Also, they're responsible for this traffic we see and the commuter traffic, the San Francisco people going to East Bay. By shutting down the ramp onto the Bay Bridge in the financial district, they're forcing a lot of these folks to use Marin as a shortcut. So the MTC is really the villain in the case. I, I agree with Alex. The MTC is probably the board I would want to get on mission uh, to work on the atrocious traffic issues that we have here. And you can't make a difference unless you actually get involved with a committee like that. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to blow up as much as we might all like to see that happen. Um, I think the commission is going to stick around. And so we need to get involved and show strong leadership to work on the traffic issues. And the main reason is you have to think about things regionally sometimes. We all like to have that local control, but our traffic is really a regional problem. The majority of our traffic comes into town. We have about 70,000 commuters driving through Marin every day, and that kills us. So we need to be able to work with other counties to express our needs. We need to um, divert those funds properly to make sure that our infrastructure is upheld and we're taking care of it, creating the roads that we need to. Um, getting a, a direct connection between 101 and 580 I think would be extremely important to help free up Sir Francis Drake and the whole um, corridor speed instead of everyone on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. So MTC I think is where we can make the biggest difference and we need to get involved to help our county with our traffic problems. Well, we're all going on MTC. <laughs> uh, but I want to be on MTC for a very different reason. I, I, I feel as though we need to really take a a much broader look at regional transit because as much as it sounds really good to be widening the roads and adding more capacity to the roads, uh, roads are like water and when you open up the space it, the wa it, it just fills up and what we really need is a transit system that's convenient and efficient <coughs> and accessible and we don't have that right now, especially not in our local transit system. We need more water transportation. We need a second ferry dock, and I think we need to have more ferries not only going to the city, but we need to initiate ferry service to the East Bay and ferry service to Vallejo. And this is something that every single transit system in the Bay Area is having to deal with. One of the things is that we have money for capital improvements, but we never get additional money for operations, and that's how you improve your transit system is getting money for operations, and that's what I want to work on with MTC. Thanks. Thank you. Stand So um, the truth of the matter is, most of these choices of commissions are by seniority on the, the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> and so unless we, have, unless we have a wholesale change at the Board of Supervisors, one of us is going to be a junior member, and we'll sort of take the appointments that we can get. And those will be the lesser appointments. They won't be the most important ones. But it's important that we have a good interaction with the other supervisors who are taking these positions to make sure that they represent us and our constituents too. Um, you know, and, and that's so important in this process is looking at, looking at us up here and seeing who you think will be the best person to work with for other people. And in some cases it's for other people that have been there a long time. And I can tell you, I've worked with most of them in different capacities already in my job as uh, water director on the North Marine Water Board. But I've also worked with all the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. What does that do? It makes them answer my phone calls and listen to what I have to say, and that's really important. And so that's what I would do if I was elected. Thank you. Thank you. Brian. Uh, as had been mentioned, um, our current supervisor, because of his seniority, has a number of very important seats. He's currently the chair of the Coastal Commission. He has a seat on many other boards. So as a result of his seniority, he carries an enormous amount of clout. 
Um, the Coastal Commission for me, I think, is very important. Uh, it's something that, um, because the 4th District uh, uh, represents the entire coastline of uh, the County of Marin, um, it's something that typically uh, our, our, our district does get a seat on that commission. Not always, but it is, it is typical. Um, right now, there's a number of very large uh, uh, house proposals that are along the California coast uh, for very famous people, movie stars, uh, rock and rollers, that kind of thing, that are completely inappropriate. And I think um, because of, uh, uh, for those of you who've read the local papers, um, there's been an enormous amount of controversy. The, um, the executive director of the Coastal Commission was recently fired because of his resistance to a lot of these large development proposals. And I think it's something that, um, that if we do get that seat and it, uh, the person who's elected, um, that's something that I would very much like to have. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Well, I share equal desire to serve on the NTC and Coastal Commission, because I, I think we're, we're facing some serious issues with, with both of those things. Uh, what I would like to see is more an integrated technology in how we deal with traffic. We're doing it, we have, there are smart city programs that are going on. I'd like to see us incorporate more of that in Marin. And as far as Coastal Commission goes, uh, I'm definitely concerned about the uh, prospect of more development on the coast. And uh, one, one thing that I find very uh, disconcerting is that I have to read in the LA Times about Steve Kinsey possibly recusing himself from uh, a vote at the Coastal Commission. Why aren't we reading about that in the IJ? That's just an aside. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think um, in as much as we've had 90 minutes, we'll just have one more question and then a wrap up. Uh, so the next, the next question will go, uh, start, we'll start with Alex. Historically, Homestead Valley has been underrepresented in District 4. What specifically will you do to make sure our needs and interests are better represented? I think the, uh, all the West Marin, East Marin that is in the 4th District has been underrepresented uh, over the years. Uh, The fourth district, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe he has two aides. Uh, I think the aides can be assigned to do a liaison with, with you folks, and also with the other communities at Corte Madera and Novato uh, on a regular basis, almost like having an office here without having a physical office. Uh, again, uh, East Marin has been underserved. So just be specific, I think one of the things that the supervisor has a lot of power of is where money goes within their district. They have a certain amount of money that they are in charge of, essentially. And so I think we could find more money here to help out with your roads, uh, just to make sure that the maintenance is getting done down here the way it should. Um, another thing I, I look at, uh, the way this is set up here, I believe that the county actually owns this property, not necessarily the buildings on it. But I think that the county needs to be able to step up a little bit more and help you guys to make sure that the infrastructure here is up to date. I know they worked with you to get this building redone, and that was great, but it was, I believe you guys taxed yourselves for it, and you're paying that back now, which is, you know, I applaud you guys for doing that. But I think the county could work to find matching funds. Um, I don't know, I don't think it would take an exorbitant amount of money to throw into this part of the community, but I think it's, it really comes down to money and helping you guys get certain things done that you need to do here. Well, as they say, 90% is showing up. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, I want to have regular roundtable discussions with whoever wants to participate. The only way we can know what your needs are is to be here and find out what they are. Now, I, because of my work with Safe Routes to Schools, I actually have worked in East Marin, and I know all of the different communities. I've worked extensively in all of them and I'm very aware of a lot of the issues, but there's no way you can know unless you really talk to the people. I also, in addition to wanting to have the roundtable discussions, I want to have an advisory council that will come out of those roundtables where representatives from those, uh, from those discussions keep me abreast of what's going on and how things are going. It's a big, sprawling district, and I really want to serve every single community as best as I can, and the best way to do that is to, in many ways, empower you 
to be able to be communicating with me and letting me know what's going on here so that I can be responsive to that. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly being accessible is one thing that's important and that's how I run my political life is being accessible. I'll continue to be accessible. I know the 4th District really well. I, as you know, I ran in 2004 and I learned a lot about it. This time again, I learned some more about it. And it's a tough job. It's a hard job to do. We've been represented by two strong candidates over the last 44 years, Gary Giacomini and Steve Kinsey. And we need to have someone who is equally as strong, equally understands the district, and equally as accessible, um, and maybe even more so at the end. They don't seem to be as accessible when they're leaving offices and they start. But I promise to have office hours, regular office hours here at Homestead at least once a month. I promise to have my staff available to you anytime I'm not available. And my, my interest is serving Marin in the 4th District. I don't have a big interest to become Coastal Commissioner or something else out of here. I want to do the job here for local, local constituents first and then think about those things later on after a few years. Brian? I would agree with everything that Dennis just said. Um, I think it's absolutely a, a critical for any supervisor to become familiar with the people and the communities that they serve. Um, in my case, uh, I would make it a point of becoming familiar with all your roads and streets. I would like to see them personally, um, uh, to look at their condition, um, talk to the people, uh, the, the, the organizations um, that are responsible for ma maintaining your infrastructure, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, have a, a detailed observation and hike through all of your uh, immediate open spaces to see the condition that that's in as well. I think. Um, uh, it is absolutely the responsibility of a, of a supervisor to be completely responsive to a community. If you were to call me, I would immediately determine what the problem is, what the concern is, and I would assign someone to it essentially instantly. Um, uh, most communities in Marin, um, and in particular the 4th District, uh, was gerrymandered, so as has it been mentioned, it's unique, it has a variety of different needs, um, but, it's, but it's absolutely critical that whoever you do elect be completely responsive. Thank you. So I've walked about a thousand houses oh, in the... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay, I can go last if you want. <laughs> That's okay, Al. I know you didn't need it. Well, this, this is probably the easiest question uh, for me because I live in Homestead Valley and it was my deep love for this community um, that got me involved. Uh, besides, you know, uh, that the issue touched me in a very deep place. And I've, I've become, uh, I've, I've had the benefit of establishing many really great relationships since 2010 being like thrust into a firestorm controversy. And I've, I've grown an affection for some people that were uh, my, what I consider my biggest ad adversaries during that situation. And um, so I'm here. And uh, I think my, my biggest challenge is, is going out to West Marin to get familiar with more of those communities because I hardly ever leave my house because I love it here, you know, except to, you know, walk the loop and walk. And we got married in Stolte Grove. And uh, so it's just about communication. I'm the most communicative, excuse me, communicative person you'll probably ever meet in your life. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, here I go again. Uh, I've walked over a thousand homes in the East Marin, and I can tell you the people in Novato, the people in Corte Madera, all feel the same way that you feel. And that's one of the issues that we've had is that Mr. Kenzie's taken a great deal of care of West Marin, and I don't think he's done the same job in East Marin. And I want to make sure that we, moving forward, have a good, solid, care of East Marin and I will do town halls and I will work regularly to have uh, meet with homeowners associations to sit down and talk about the issues so that I understand from the ground up what the problems are but East Marin has been ignored for quite a while and we need to make sure that's fixed moving forward thank you um and now we'll uh, finish up and give uh, you each an opportunity to make a closing statement. And we'll go in reverse order, starting with Mary. Okay. I feel like I just made my statement. Okay. 
Well, um, once again, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited about the prospect of possibly becoming supervisor, even though I know I'm a dark horse in this race and probably the least known, except as the crazy sidewalk lady. Um, but I, I guarantee I'm not, I'm not crazy. And my husband thinks I'm crazy for running, but that's another story. I have uh, a, a quite a wide array of experience in, in many different jobs that I've held over the years between my singing gigs. So I feel that I, I am uniquely qualified to represent the citizenry of West Marin, which is a very wide socioeconomic swath of people. So I would just like to say thanks for your consideration. Please visit my website, marytamburo.com. Call me at 789-MARY, that's Mary with an I, area code 415, ask me any question you want. And um, see you on Tuesday. Well, not this Tuesday, but okay. June 7th, you know what I mean. Thanks. Thank you. Brian. Having worked in Marin for the last three decades on uh, planning issues and design, I've had an opportunity to become familiar with nearly every rule and regulation that governs our communities. Um, I think this gives me a unique leg up to understand the problems that we face and be able to deal with them uh, as someone who's very informed. Um, in the case of Steve Kinsey, it took him something like three years to, to be able to get his uh, sea legs and familiarize himself with the process in the county. It's something that I've been doing for a majority of my life. Um, I, I feel very strongly that the reason that I'm getting involved in this race has nothing to do with personal aggrandizement, has nothing to do with money, and nothing to do with power. It's because I grew up here. I care deeply about these communities and deeply about the people in them and care also very deeply about the environment. And I think that I'm the individual who can combine uh, a combination of my skills and my deep reverence for the place that I live in and protect this place that I love so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Visit my website or Facebook site, Merdoni First Supervisor 2016. You should be congratulated because there's twice as many people in this room tonight as there was in Puerto Madera Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm deeply committed to serving our district and county. My experience in local government as an elected official, I believe, make me ready to start working or gives me the, the ability to start working day one, and I think that's important. Um, all the candidates up here, including the ones who just left, are very, very nice people. I've got to know them all, and I really appreciated their effort. It's a tough thing to run for, for office. I've done it six times now, um, <laughs> sometimes successful. <laughs> but it's tough. It's not easy on the families and spouses and all those people that you're involved with every day. So thank you all for doing that. Um, but as you look at all of us up here, June 7th or sooner, you're going to mark your ballot. You have to decide who you want to govern this county for you in the 4th District. I like to think of it as who would you like to manage your household? Because the county is really your household in a bigger, bigger thing. So as you decide that on election day, I hopefully you'll find that you'll decide me. Because I'm all in for Marin, and I hope you are too. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, I think I, you know, I've also been involved with government, but not from a, the vantage point of an elected official, but as someone who actually has to implement the program. And I believe I have found a formula that really empowers people and gets them engaged and involved, and actually comes to the point where we solve problems to the point where everybody's actually happy in the end, which is a very unusual thing when you're working in government. And that's the reason why I have so many endorsements for me. The California Alliance for Retired Americans has given me their highest rankings of all of the candidates here. I'm endorsed by the Marin Democratic Party and the Marin Young Democrats, young and old. And um, I've also just been endorsed by the Point Race Light, and I'll just read a little few things that they had to say about me. In the diverse and impressive cast of characters in the race, one person stands out, Wendy Callens who possesses both grit and poise, grasps the issues facing Marin. Wendy will listen to people, just as she did when she brought a fair and balanced sample to her roundtable discussions. And, uh, Wendy stands out as a systemic thinker, and I am being told to stop. Uh, so please go to my website, wendycallens.com, that's Wendy with an I, Callens with a K, and learn more about my stand on the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So I do want to say thank you to you guys for this impressive turnout. Dennis is absolutely right. This is really great. I mean, smaller community, and it was impressive. So thank you guys for turning out. Because what we've done in this race, we have all you know gotten to know each other, and that's important because we're building relationships too. And it's really been an incredible experience. So hats off to the you know my fellow candidates and, and all the effort you put into it. What I want to say about closing why I hope you'll vote for me is, is to look towards leadership. And I've taken leadership rules in everything I've done over the past 20 years, um, going through the entire community. And that's something I think that stood out why and is why I've been endorsed by the North Bay Leadership Council and the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce and the Marin County Farm Bureau. I think the overarching ranching community has stood behind me steadfastly to make sure that I continue to protect West Marin and be involved in everything here in, in uh, on the inland corridors, they recognize that I'm going to come in and listen and work with everyone. And that's because I did that uh, when working with the environmental community and helped to bridge a gap that had been completely lost over the past 20 years. That's something I'm really proud of as well. So I hope you'll vote for me. Uh, go to my website, grossyforsupervisor.com. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take my time to talk about traffic. Um, <laughs> we're just drowning the traffic. And the county spends hundreds of thousands of dollars a year trying to attract more tourists to Marin. Last month, the cover of Sunset Magazine featured Muir Woods, which gets over a million visitors a year. This month, the 3A Magazine features a relatively unknown Tennessee Valley. <laughs> a treasure to behold, it says. But not for long, because tourists really do destroy just about every place that becomes a well-known <laughs> tourist site. The Vis Visitors Bureau does not tell the truth about the benefit that Marin receives from the hordes of tourists. The money mostly goes to tour bus operators, some restaurants, while well, we're left with their pollution, their trash, and their traffic. <laughs> it's important to focus on the duties of the supervisor in determining the best candidate. The supervisors are responsible for governance, directing staff actions, as well as providing fiscal oversight and spending priorities for an operating budget of about a half a billion dollars. I have 24 years proven track record as an executive with successful leadership management and most importantly financial and analytical skills. I will be ready to start on day one to protect our small town suburban rural character, assure Marin is fiscally sound, and restore transparency and engagement to the government. I will serve with commitment to return common sense decisions and government accountability to Marin. Please take one of my flyers in the back with a summary of my key issues and the endorsements I have from key Marin leaders and see my website at aldugan4supervisor.org for more details. I ask you to vote for me on June 7th as your Marin County Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, and this ends our candidates forum for this evening. Uh, for more information, if you need it or want it, you may want to go to the league's voteredge.org website. And if you enter your street address and zip code, you'll be able to see your own ballot with links to the candidates, the issues, the ballot measures, and information about the voting process. We also have important election resource material at our website, marinlwv.org. The League of Women Voters welcomes both men and women members, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, thank you again to the participants uh, in the debate and timekeeper Linda, and particularly to the audience for being uh, so responsive and respectful. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.